and welcome to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 262. When you're working on your genealogy, you've got data and records coming from all kinds of directions. You're looking at websites and gathering information. You are conducting interviews with your relatives. Um, You're visiting the archives. You're downloading documents. It's coming from all sides. Some of it is stuff that you're actively working on, and some of it just needs to be saved for later. Um, The rest of it has already been analyzed, and it's ready to be archived. So all this data that's coming your way is at varying stages of the genealogical process. So that means that we need kind of a variety of storage locations. And in this episode, we're going to talk about a genealogy organization and workflow that really works. I call it the data workflow for your genealogy. I'm going to share with you my genealogy data workflow, the way that I do it. And we'll talk about how it all kind of fits together to make sure that you can have an uncluttered desk where you can work and the ability to instantly put your hands on the information and the documents that you need when you need them. Now, of course, everybody has a different way of doing things, but a lot of you have written in, uh, certainly over the years, and asked me exactly what is it that I'm doing. So that's what I want to share with you today. And I'm hoping that uh, it will clear up some questions for you, perhaps give you some new ideas, or maybe you'll want to implement the entire process. So let's get started with genealogy data flow. Today, we're going to roll up our sleeves and do some work. And the work is basically how we work our data, what the workflow looks like. And um, Barbara left me a very interesting comment. She says that she found our recent videos about how Alice the genealogist avoids the rabbit hole. Did you watch those? The idea was that we talked about how Alice the genealogist, which is kind of all of us, um, can fall into rabbit holes, get sidetracked by stuff and how to kind of overcome that. So she said she really enjoyed that. She says, I got a lot of BSOs in my life, (laughs) bright, shiny objects, right? And she says, so uh, having them in a holding area worked really well, just like we demonstrated using Evernote to help hold your BSOs. But she asked me, once you have processed them, you know, whatever the genealogical document is, and extracted the information that you need, do you need to remove them from Evernote and place them in your digital genealogy filing system? So this is really about the process. What's a really good workflow process when you're dealing with stuff and figuring out which programs and things uh, to put these items in? And there's certainly a lot of items. She says, I get a bit confused in thinking about what of the other purposes of Evernote might be. Wouldn't I just save my documents, newspaper clippings, etc., to my digital files on my hard drive? and also to my Google Drive folder, so she's using Google Drive as well. Is there any need to also have them in Evernote? Well, that's a really good question. (laughs) And, you know, we talk about a lot of these tools. I certainly like to share with you the tools that I'm using that I'm finding really effective. And uh, that means we've got stuff in more than one place, right? So it is kind of easy to get confused and have stuff where do I look? Where is my stuff? Uh, Where do I put this? And pretty soon we kind of stop putting stuff away because we're not sure where to put it. So if we we know we have a place to put it, then we always follow the same process. So I wanted to talk about that today, really kind of just share with you my workflow and um, see if by chance this kind of works for you. Now Evernote does play a part in my workflow. Clearly it does. I talk about it here a lot on the show. It's basically a cloud note taking service. And there are several out there. I just happen to use Evernote. Um, It really helps to have a consistent way to capture and find what you're actively working on. And I really do think there's a distinction between the stuff we're actively working on, and the stuff that we need to archive that really does not need to be in front of us right now. And my workflow that I'm going to share with you today uh, works great for me, but it's just one way. So please keep in mind that uh, there might be pieces of it that will work well for you. If you have adopted Evernote, then maybe you'll be really interested in that part of it. Or if you're using a different note taking service, 
Um, or it may not be, but it might just be interesting to see how another genealogist does it. So I'm going to do my best to kind of share with you how I uh, pass things through the Cook Research Desk <laughs> and try to get as much accomplished as I can. So follow along and see what might fit for you. Okay, so there are really pr- about five major workstations through which your data flows. Okay, so this is data you're finding online, in person, wherever. And I say data, but it could be documents, it could be web clippings, it could be anything. But it's information. It's information about your family history that you're doing in your research. So the first kind of major workstation or place where it might flow through is um, there's your active genealogy work. And there's a couple different places that that might end up. It might end up in Evernote. Uh, It might be some information that also goes on to one of your genealogy websites that you have a subscription to. Maybe you want to add that information to your family tree. Um, There might be a pending folder that you like to use on your hard drive. Um, I have a couple of those, but I don't use those too much on the hard drive side. And I'll, I'll explain why. I do, though, have archival three ring notebooks. We've talked about those here on the show. See episode seven for that. And I believe that's part of the premium membership archive. So if you're a premium member, you can go back and watch that full video class. I set up my three ring notebooks because I need a place to put the paper that I really want to hang on to. And so that's all organized within the binder. But I do include a pending tab because sometimes paper comes to the desk and I don't want it piling up in a box on my desk or not a box on my desk, just piles everywhere. Um, I lose track of stuff and that wastes time. So the idea is to get it into the binder for the family that it applies to, but get it into a section where you know this isn't finished yet. It's pending, pending processing. And we'll talk about processing. And then another area is conclusions added to your master genealogy database. So when the information's flowing through and you've drawn conclusions and you've really proven something and you feel good about it, you want to add that to one place that's kind of the brain of the operation. And that's your genealogy software, uh, your database. And yes, you can put your family tree on websites and such. Uh, But we'll talk about why I don't do that as my primary master database. You need one place that you go to that says, this is the final word on where I'm at right now in this moment in time in my research. So that's what the master database is about. So that's your computer software. And uh, then stuff is going to flow into your archival digital storage area because there's going to be a lot of digital stuff. These days, we tend to have more digital than we have paper. So this is going to go onto your computer. And this is something we covered my uh, my whole online computer folder structure. We t- talked about that in episode eight. And again, uh, that is now in the premium archive as well. And that was all about archiving and, and step by step how you set up all the file folders and what the process is behind that. So you got to have a place that you know where you're going to put stuff away when you're done with it. And you can keep archival stuff in Evernote as well. Um, And I'm going to show you how you can kind of do both. So we'll talk about that too. And then there's the paper. So we need a place to archive the paper that we have, we finished processing it. And now it needs to go away from me. That's my three ring binders. And we talked about how I set up my three ring binders in episode six. But don't forget the last piece of where your data flows. It should flow into an automatic cloud backup. And this is an integral part of the whole structure because we know at any step along the way, whether it's your computer, or whether it's somebody's website or whatever, your, something could happen to it. And so we just want that one more extra layer of protection to make sure that um, if something goes wrong, and I can tell you, this summer, I dropped my phone in the pool. (laughs) It was literally in the pool for like two and a half seconds. It is toast. It is so dead. And so having cloud backup, you know, it's thousands of photos and all these conferences I've been to and all these pictures I take to put in my... um, my column in Family Tree Magazine, oh my gosh. It can happen 
in a flash and you don't think it will, it can happen to your laptop too or your computer. And there's a zillion different ways things could go wrong. So I use Backblaze as my automatic backup. Whatever you use, just make sure you have one. Um, but certainly if you want to try out um, Backblaze, they've been very much a part of the genealogy community. I know those guys well. They're awesome people. So you can check out backblaze.com slash Lisa. Okay, so that's kind of the different places and the different kinds of stuff that's going to go come through your workflow. Not everything that I find, all this stuff that's incoming, you know, when I'm out there doing my active research, I'm hopefully got stuff coming my way. I've got documents and information. But not everything I find while I'm researching is ready to be archived the moment I find it, of course, right? So it might be stuff that I'm exploring in my current research project. I, I need it. I'm working with it. Uh, it might be an item pending analysis. Maybe I got lucky and I got a whole bunch of downloads of stuff and it just cannot all be processed on the same date. So it's pending, the and my analysis, right? And there might be some items that I think, well, this looks pretty good. I've, I've really analyzed it. But at this point, it's still kind of unproven. I'm not so sure that this really is the right person or it's the right conclusion. So it needs to kind of hang tight and be part of the active research until I figure that out. There's also items playing a role in a bigger research question that I want altogether. So maybe I'm not currently working in that particular area, but I know that that could come into play in a bigger project or a different project I'm working on. So this is stuff I'm not ready to archive yet. And of course, bright, shiny objects, those BSOs, the stuff that catches our eye, we get lucky, we just see something, we go, Oh, my gosh, look at that. That is so I can't wait to look at that. That has something to do with my other family line. But right now I'm trying to work on this research project. So the bright, shiny objects need a place to be housed. And that's what we talked about in that last video. And I'll have links to those in the in the video description below here on YouTube. And of course, in the show notes. So it's stuff that I find along the way. It's not related to my project, but I, I can't archive it because I don't want to forget to go back and really spend some time on it and analyze it. So a cloud based note taking tool is going to help me deal with all of this. And that's why we talked about Evernote. We have different devices, tablets, computers, phones, all that stuff is how we're gathering this information. We might be doing an audio interview with somebody that we're recording on our phone. We've took a picture of a grave site. We've created some videos. Um, you know, most of my research happens on my desktop. But more and more, there's stuff coming from all directions. So this really solves the problem because a cloud based note taking tool is going to allow you to use all your devices, and hopefully include the ability to gather together any kind of digital item that gets created. And so it can all land in one place. Like I said, I'm using Evernote, but you might be using OneNote or Google Keep. There's several different ones out there. If Evernote is sounds new to you, um, make a note, go check out episode 70 while it's still free on YouTube. And uh, check out the show notes over at my website, because they're really, really detailed. I've got all the, the step by step on that, how to kind of get started and try it, you can try it for free. So I'm going to talk about Evernote, it could be any cloud note taking type thing you're using. But a cloud note taking service is really unique because it allows me to capture and hold these items that are coming my way through different devices. Um, it also gives me the ability to search and retrieve a lot more effectively and efficiently than I can on my computer. And that's thanks to optical character recognition. So Barbara was asking about, well, why don't I just put this on my hard drive? Well, and that makes sense. But my hard drive doesn't have OCR on it. And so I want to be able to really quickly find stuff. And also, if I file it away on some deep folder on my hard drive, I'm not really capturing it and holding it, am I? I'm, I'm actually kind of putting it away out of sight, and I might never get back to it. And I might think later, three years down the road, I look at it and go, Oh, I guess that's a done deal. Why? Well, I, I guess that's, but maybe I didn't prove it at all. I didn't really take the time to analyze it. So I think of this cloud note taking service as this active workspace, the pending workspace. It's not out of sight, out of mind. 
And um, this is where I'm going to be working my current genealogy research plan. Whatever my research question is I've developed and I've put a plan together to try to answer it, this is what's happening here in my active workstation of Evernote. And the beauty of making a note-taking system like Evernote, my active workspace, is that if I want to get together with a distant cousin or another researcher and I want to be able to share what I found, I don't want to be, have to go digging and attaching all of these items out of my hard drive onto an email or something. With Evernote, with one shareable link, I can really easily share the stuff that I've gathered so far. We want a tool that sets us up for success because we want to anticipate down the road the kinds of things that are going to come up while we're still actively working it. And that's kind of what led me to draw this conclusion on how I use Evernote. And storing and sharing media. So a lot of the media that I've been doing lately has been coming off my phone. And uh, thankfully, because there's a mobile app for this cloud note taking service, Evernote, I can easily send photos and um, particularly my audio recordings, my videos I'm creating or taking, all that is really easy versus if you've ever tried to, um, you know, email a video to yourself or save it to Dropbox or something, it can take a long time. So getting it into an Evernote note, wow, it just syncs right up immediately and automatically. So does everything go straight into an Evernote? Well, let's take a look at what happens to the kinds of digital stuff that I find. Um, I might have a downloaded genealogy record that I find on a website. Um, I might be taking a clipping of an article, particularly newspaper articles. Fantastic, because if it goes into Evernote, it's going to get OCR'd. I might be taking a photograph of a gravesite uh, with my phone. Any kind of stuff that's coming my way, I'm going to have to decide if that's going to go straight into Evernote or not. So part of this is about working my genealogy plan before a digital item is deemed relevant and ready to archive. I've already analyzed it. I've already extracted all the information, all that stuff. We have a lot of work to do because we do need to spend some time making sure we've evaluated it properly and we have analyzed it. We have extracted that information and that information may not just go into my software. I might also want to put some of that into my one of my online trees. I tend to use my online trees as a way to try to um, generate hints and generate connections with other researchers and things that they're not comprehensive like my database, but that might be a place where this information needs to go. But not everything can happen in one sitting. And anybody who's been doing research for a while knows that sometimes great stuff comes your way, sometimes not, but you can't always complete all those tasks at the one time that you're sitting there. You might need to come back to it this weekend and you want to be able to pick it up and put it down. So um, we may be doing that several times as we're going through this processing phase of working with the item. We are probably going to pick it up and put it down several times on different occasions. So these are our active items. I just want to stress that there's a real difference between the active workspace that's happening and the archival. We may still need uh, that item also for, for reference as we're working a bigger research plan and trying to reach our goals. Now, the opposite of the active is the archive stuff. And uh, this is has already been fully processed. I've analyzed it. I've evaluated it. It's no longer playing an active role in my research plan. So here's an example. Um, you know, I get a document, I work with it and everything, but now I, it's that, that has to do with my mom's side of the family. Now I'm working on my dad's side of the family. So that's the current research plan, but I might need to look at it again. Um, it's important that it's archived in such a way that I can always put my hands on it again really easily. But really, because it's not part of the active plan, it doesn't need to be right in front of me. Okay, so active digital items, those typically are going straight into Evernote. Okay, my active items are uh, going there. They, I, these are what I consider to be the stuff that I'm currently working on. This is not what I consider to be my archival workspace. Might there be things then in Evernote that are also on my hard drive? Absolutely, and that's fine. And it's fine because there's no 
storage limit on Evernote. So when I look at an item in Evernote, I know that that's kind of a working document is how I think about it. When I see that same item somewhere on my hard drive, I know it's been analyzed, it's been processed, it's, the information has been extracted. This is part of my family history. And I know where to find it on my hard drive. So it's okay that there is duplication. That's why I keep coming back to this idea that the, the database is the, the brain of the organization, the master. Yes, I have that same information somewhere else on my family tree on, you know, my heritage or ancestry. And that duplication is fine. But I always have to know what's the final word. And the final word on my documentation of my sources is my hard drive. The final word on my family tree data is my software database. If there if that same information is available in other places, because that's where I was dabbling and working, great, no problem. This is not to say that you can't store everything in Evernote forever. Just want to make that clear. However, there are a few reasons that I don't store everything or use Evernote as what we call archival. So I want to share that with you because I don't think we've really talked about that here on the show. Stay tuned. We've got more right after this. Today's episode is sponsored by MyHeritage, a global discovery platform enjoyed by 110 million people worldwide. MyHeritage has it all and offers a full service experience that bridges your past, present, and future. MyHeritage has developed powerful genealogy tools to enrich your family tree and take your research to the next level. Receive automatic matches to family trees of fellow MyHeritage users and historical records, which provide new details that you can add to your tree. Explore 12 billion historical records to uncover fascinating new insights about your ancestors. Add new information to your family tree in one click. Check your tree for inaccuracies, colorize your black and white photos, and connect with relatives around the globe. My Heritage makes it all possible and puts the discoveries at your fingertips. I've been colorizing some of my own personal family photos, and not only are they beautiful, but in many of the photos, it's actually been revealing more details so I can see more of my family history. Growing your family tree is easier than ever before with my heritage. The discoveries are out there and waiting to be made. Visit myheritage.com and try it today. That's myheritage.com. And now back to the genealogy data flow. So why I don't store everything in Evernote. If we store everything on a website, or in a cloud service, they or their hosting provider, either one of them have the ability to pull the plug on that. So that's your data, right? And in a sense, if that's our one and only place, they have all the control. And um, I don't want to take that risk. Is that likely to happen? No, probably not. But it has happened. So knowing that, we just have to be smart and say, I don't know about you, I'm not willing to take the risk that something changes tomorrow. And it turns out that my data is no longer available. And uh, also, you know, most websites, if they were to really to go out of business, or they were to sell to another company, they're probably going to have and typically, if you read the terms of service, you'll see there'll be a, like a 30 day notice. That sounds like a lot. It's not a lot when you have a ton of information and you got to figure out how to move it. I don't want to be in that position of scrambling to move it. What if I'm on vacation for a couple of weeks and I miss it? Or, oh no, what if that email notification goes to my spam folder and I never saw it? And the 30 days passes. You get my drift. I, I'm, I'm a big risk taker in many ways, but not with this stuff that I have worked on since I was eight years old. I've been working on this stuff. So I don't want to lose it, right? I know you don't either. So if I only leave it on Evernote, then I've put it completely in the hands of this online company that could be gone tomorrow. Any company could be gone tomorrow, purchase tomorrow, have a big power outage, who knows what could happen? Okay, not to scare you, but just to say, let's let's be real, right? We want to make sure that we're taking care of our stuff. So in order to retain that control of my family history data, my long-term storage 
the archival stuff, that needs to be within my control. So that's my computer. That's my hard drive. And it's any external hard drives that I have that I want to add stuff to. I tend to put a lot of digitized photos on the external hard drive. Um, I feel okay doing that, even though those can break, probably easier than a laptop could. But when I plug that external hard drive into my computer and leave it plugged in, when Backblaze does the automatic backup, it sees that as part of it and it's included in my subscription. So I'm getting all of that backed up. Yes, they're an online cloud provider, but they aren't the only one I'm using. They are just the backup. So if they disappear tomorrow, I still have my hardware and I can put something else in place very quickly. Okay, so there's a little bit of a distinction there. And I do more and more paper printouts. And so for so many years, we've been trying to kind of get away from paper. But I also consider that, you know what, I've been cleaning out this, this closet I have with all this stuff I've been collecting for the years on both sides of our families. And it's amazing how the paper endures. <laughs> have you noticed that? It does. It's endeared better than my phone that ended up at the bottom of the pool. That's for sure. Okay, so that's kind of why I don't use Evernote as my final archival plan and why I really believe in taking control of your own data. I have a whole video about that in, in uh, the premium video collection as well. So maintaining control of your data when it comes to my active research project, I'm willing to trade the risk for the speed and the convenience. That's why I'm willing to put that stuff in Evernote. And, and right now, that's the only place it is because I haven't yet fully processed it. But that's a, really a fraction of my total research. If um, the pending stuff, the, the stuff in my current project disappeared tomorrow, that would be sad and I'd be bummed, but it would be absolutely okay because it's a very small portion of my total amount of family history. And it's none of the stuff that I have already said, this is absolutely, I feel very confident this is my family. So, um, and you know, as you process stuff, as you're working with it in Evernote, you, you are putting it other places, so you're not even then going to lose everything. Um, but I do think that there's such an advantage in the speed with which you can work with stuff in Evernote, the OCR that they apply, the convenience of being able to collaborate. I mean, there's just so many upsides during a research project that I think it's worth it. So when I find an item, I have a decision to make. Where am I going to put it? <laughs> am I going to put it in Evernote? Well, it depends what it is. So let's talk about that. So here are the items that I would save to Evernote. And again, I have all of this on the show notes for you as well. Items that really need and are benefited by OCR. If, if OCR is going to make a big difference, I'm taking a web clipping of a newspaper article. Um, I have, you know, some other typed up, maybe a clipping out of a book from Google Books. Um, there's all kinds of different documents. Even I've showed you in a past episode, we were talking about my Irish research. You remember that? And I had photographs of the Scully tombstone from my Scully family. And Evernote was able to read it with OCR. It was awesome. So I could retrieve it super easy by simply typing that surname into the search engine in Evernote. So Newspaper articles, uh, web clippings, photographs of tombstones, that kind of stuff, that's going to really benefit by going directly into Evernote. Anything I'm creating on my phone and my tablet, well, that makes sense because the app makes it so easy just to funnel that right in. So um, even if it's already something that um, I know eventually is going to go straight practically into archive, I'm still going to probably send it to myself through Evernote. It's just the easiest way to do it. So photos of grave sites, documents, interview recordings, video of research trips that I've done, uh, all that stuff's going to go into Evernote. Also, items that need analysis before being confirmed as pertaining to my family. So an example of that would be you're working at a genealogy website and you find a document and you go, this is great, but I'm not totally sure if that's my guy. I'm going to download that document and have it in Evernote so I can really spend some time on it. 
Cloud note taking services make working your research plan so much easier. It's one place for all the stuff to come, easy search, and not just finding a single item, but any combination of notes. My friends, that, that's really why I spent so much time on this last week with Evernote is that the idea that I can put in, I can click and say from these tags with this keyword, I want those notes. Think about your hard drive. Gosh, stuff's all over the place and it's, it's it could be very organized, but it, it is kind of challenging to try to very quickly pull just those four items from totally different areas together that you need in order to cross-reference them and analyze them. And Evernote, it's instantaneous. And it's all right there in front of you. It's in one column. You can, I mean, there's just no comparison. So that's part of it is that not just the ease of retrieval, but the fact that you can get any combination of notes immediately, even a, a census record that has, you know, three different families on it. If it has that one family you need, boy, you need to grab that and you don't want to have 16 copies of that all over your hard drive. So um, one of the things I love to do too is collaborate with people. So again, having an Evernote makes that really easy. And stuff that I would say to Evernote are bright, shiny objects. We talked about that. Downloaded genealogy records. I don't have time to process right now. Perfect. And uh, I could simply have a tag pending to be processed <laughs> along with all the other tags that I add to that note. So when I have time to sit down and actually work on the backlog, wouldn't it be it's nice to have a backlog of really good stuff to go look at, right? I want to be able to click my pending tab and also then say, oh, wow, look at all these stuff. Okay, well, let's work on all the census records. And I add that tag to my, my kind of search that pulls out which notes I'm going to be working on. So um, using the tagging system, that's one of the things that makes it so unique and so effective in terms of working with your stuff. So let's talk about the stuff that I might then save directly to my computer hard drive. Well, these are sources that have been processed already. Okay, so I've finished them. They're going to go to the archive. Um, is the item a digital scan of a visual image? You know, something very visual. Uh, family photos, postcards. I do lots of postcards that I find and all kinds of historical uh, pictures and things. So when I find a uh, postcard, and this is Winthrop, Minnesota from the time frame that my husband's family lived there, um, I already know that's the right place. That's the right time. I'm, I'm there. I don't have to prove that. I know they're in Winthrop. So I will just put those straight into where I archive location images for that family. And I'm going to put that on my computer. And another reason there's really no need to just put that into Evernote is that imagery is going to be larger file size. So if you really don't need it to work your research plan, maybe it's just some social history context, you know, stuff that you're finding. Why take up the monthly storage? Because you are limited on a monthly basis. Um, when it comes to putting stuff into Evernote. So I figure that stuff's just going to go straight into the hard drive because it's not actually part of the analysis. Make sense? And really large files that I create on my computer. So I do videos and audio and stuff on my phone, and that's really easy to send through the Evernote app. But I'm making kind of larger family history videos. Um, we've talked about that here on the sh on the show on the channel, and uh, I love doing that. But they're big, and they're uh, I usually do them at the highest resolution possible. So, again, why drop that in Evernote? It's not really active research. It's an archival item. It's something I'm going to maybe share with the family or whatever. So I don't want to you know put twenty megabytes of video or a gigabyte of video. I mean, I don't know who knows how big the video is um, into Evernote if I don't need to and then gobble up that monthly storage. So that would be an example of something that would go straight to my computer hard drive, not into Evernote. And of course, I do have a system for organizing my hard drive. Um, so it makes it super easy to very quickly find what I'm looking for. And we've talked about this in past episodes. So uh, if you're a premium member, you can go and check out the archival version of that. And also, if you want to follow my system, uh, members can go and watch my 
video class with the handout hard drive organization, step-by-step -step setting up all your files. So the bottom line is, whenever I need to find something for my active research, I'm going to look in one of two places. First, in Evernote, which is my software, uh, note-taking software, and then I would look on my computer hard drive. It's not going to take me very long. Evernote's going to be an instant look. It's either there or it's not. If it's not, I know it's on my hard drive. And there might be a reason for that. So in that respect, it takes a little longer sometimes to find stuff on my hard drive. But it's so fast on Evernote, no problem. So archiving processed items, the stuff that you've finished, you've reached your goal, you know that you've answered this question, it's time to archive your stuff. Well, I could just leave it in Evernote, that's not a problem. But I want all my genealogical sources archived on my computer. And I do that for long term storage. I also like the fact that I know that Backblaze is backing that up automatically. So Yes, you can leave it in Evernote, but I've already explained the reasons why I don't do that. You can't just download everything with one click in its original file format. Okay, so if you've put in 100 census records and you're archiving them all in Evernote and some 30 day thing happens or some, you know, thing and they say, oh, it's going to be sold. We're not going to have this business anymore, which could happen to any service. Any genealogy website, doesn't matter. Um, if that happens, there isn't one button to click to, to, to then just extract everything. You could extract everything, but you're not going to like the file type it's in. And it's going to all be in one block. They have something called an Ever, there's an Evernote kind of file extension, or you could save it as a web page, an HTML. This is not what you want, my friend. So that doesn't really work. You can't just click one thing and get everything out. You can save, though, individual digitized items that are in your note, like the census record that you downloaded so that you could work with it, make it part of your research plan. Now it's time to archive it. Genealogical records can be saved individually or any image, any web clipping can be saved individually to your hard drive. Since there is no lifetime storage limit, I just leave my stuff in Evernote. If I already put it in Evernote, even when I go to archive it to the hard drive, I can leave it there. That's fine. It doesn't cost me anything. And it really doesn't clutter up my ability to find anything else because the search feature is so effective. So why not have it there? That's fine. You can remove it if you want to, but you don't need to. Um, I also save the image to my computer hard drive. So I want to show you how to do that. I'm looking at this census record. I'm going to right click on it. If you're on a Mac, I think you might command click and save as. So we've right clicked on the image itself within the note, save it as, give it a name. And now it is a JPEG saved to my computer. And I double checked. This image is exactly the same size as it was when I downloaded it first from the website. So we didn't lose anything. And it was in a really convenient spot during the active research process. And with just that one click. So when I kind of wrap up that research um, plan, then I'll go through maybe and archive these. I And typically, I'm doing that as I go. Once I've confirmed, yep, this is the family. That's great. Okay. Even if it remains part of my plan, I'm still working with this family in um, Evernote. At the moment that I've agreed that this is the right person, right family, I'm going to go ahead and archive it into the hard drive. So the fact that I just do it along the way, it's just one extra click. If I do that consistently, I'm in good shape. I never have to worry about where stuff is or if I've done it or not. You can even make a note to yourself or add a tag archived. How about that? Create an archive tag in your tags list in Evernote. Okay. And of course, your research never ends. So it's not like you might not need it again in the future. Okay, so after I've answered my research question, I quickly develop the next one, of course, and I plan a new plan around it. So of course, 
your stuff never ends. So what happens later when you want to find your stuff? Now you've got some things in some different places. That could be a little scary, but it's not because there's a method to the madness here. Um, I may have my family tree information on genealogy websites in online family trees. I might have stuff in Evernote. Of course, I obviously do. Um, I might even have my own family history website. So I've got some stuff that's been uploaded there. That's the sharing out of the, the research. But my database, my software on my computer is the last word on what I believe to be accurate about my family history what I have discovered so far. So it is the brain of the operation. Think of it that way. That means I'm going to turn to my database, my software, whenever I want to find something. If if I don't instantly find it, I'm going to look at my software. Or it might be that somebody asks me a question and I'm going to go look and look it up. So as I'm drawing conclusions and I'm adding data to my family tree in my database, of course, I'm citing my sources all these sources I'm working with in Evernote and on my computer. So therefore, everything I need to know about my tree that is proven, if you will, if it's concluded, then that's in my software. And that's an area where I can control it. So Again, if somebody comes along and says, well, Lisa, what about this? That doesn't look quite right. I found something different. You're not right. Well, I can go look that up in my database and I'm going to see all my sources cited. And I can quickly look up the answer and see where I got it. Remember, if it's part of something I know I'm currently working on, I'm going to look at Evernote first. But typically, if it's been cited in the database, that's an archive. I know it is because I've already drawn a conclusion. I've already added it. It has been cited and I know exactly what the source is. So because of the way I structure my hard drive organization and my binder, I know exactly where to look. So I only have three places to look. My computer, the archival digital files, especially if it's not part of my active research. Of course, Evernote if it is part of the current research and that surname binder if it happens to be something in paper form. So I can usually tell by looking at the source citation, sometimes I'll even say in the source citation (laughs) or make a note to myself that that's an original paper document, right? So I will know, well, that's going to be there in my binders. So here's a few final thoughts. I I know this is a lot to take in and it's always kind of weird listening to somebody else's, um, you know, process. If you've heard it all and go, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. That's fine. That's cool. Uh, maybe you heard some things and you're like, I hadn't thought about that. And so I'm, that's what I'm hoping is that you're just going to uh, maybe get some nuggets and things that will help you be um, the kind of researcher that you want to be. So there are exceptions to any rule, right? And none of these are actually really rules. They're rules for me because I've already developed this, this process. So I stick to it. Um, and there might be items even, and there are for me, that just don't neatly fall exactly into my process. So I reserve the right to make the decision. And you know what? You can always make notes to yourself. That's the beauty of the cloud note taking is that you can just type in a little something extra to just jog yourself, remind yourself, uh, explain why it's here and not there, whatever it is. Um, Be good to yourself. (laughs) Be nice to yourself and your research. And Um, Just know you're doing the best you can and you can leave yourself little breadcrumb uh, notes along the way. Use your own best judgment on how to handle the exceptions. Life is full of exceptions. And one last thought I want to make sure I leave you with is to be sure to share your Evernote credentials if you go with a service like this and your software, your computer password, all that stuff. Make sure you're putting that those passwords and credentials in a secure spot and that you have at least one trusted relative who knows how to get their hands on it or who has a copy. This is really important because just like something could happen to a website tomorrow, something could happen to one of us tomorrow. And, um, you know, we want to make sure that our legacy that we're building here, this empire of family history is going to be passed on and um, something that future generations can really enjoy. Uh, If you want to learn more about saving your research from destruction, 
episode 10 was all about that, and that is part of the premium member archive, the video class archive as well. So that, my friends, is my genealogy data flow. I don't know what you think. Maybe you could go in the comments. You could say, Lisa, you're all wet. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> or, hey, I heard you mention that I didn't know that about the storage limit. I didn't know that about, I hadn't thought about what if something happens to this service. You put it in the comments. would love to hear uh, what you think and uh, be encouraging to other uh, genealogists who come along the way who might appreciate your ideas as well. Well, thanks for joining me for this episode. It's episode 262 of the Genealogy Gems podcast. If you are new to this podcast, I hope that you will um, take a moment and head over to lisalouisecook.com or genealogygems.com. They'll take you to the same place. And on our homepage, you'll find a red button for the newsletter. That's the best way to stay in touch with me and to find out about all of the audio shows like this one, all of the videos that we do over at the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. And of course, if you are a premium member, it's the best way to find out about the new exciting uh, live episodes and video classes that we have for you. So uh, head over there, sign up for the free newsletter. It comes out one, about once a week and you're going to get a special bonus download with the first email. So that's kind of a little thank you gift to you for staying in touch. And if there is something that you would like to hear about on an upcoming episode, email me and let me know what that is at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. Also over at our website under podcast, uh, you can go to this episode number 262 to the show notes page. And uh, there we'll have a link to more detailed information on our website with all the how to's and the things we talked about in this episode. But also you will find a comment section. We talked about that earlier about um, come and share your ideas. What's working for you? What doesn't work for you? What questions that you have? And I would love to address it for you here on an upcoming episode. Again, thanks so much for listening, my friend. I will talk to you soon.